welcome back to the physiologist sang and sang and sang and yeah um today let's talk a little bit about what the heck is with the imagery that's used in singing instruction oh my gosh um back several years ago when like before like reddit became a source for singing and you know it was like the era of forums um, <laughs> I remember there being a lot of debates about like if a teacher's teaching with more of a scientific base versus an imagery based kind of thing and a lot of debates about it and like you know the real pedagogues use science and they tell you the anatomy and the physiology and they have you think that way you know um, and the truth is imagery can definitely be a part of using science to train voice and using science to help yourself understand what you should be doing with your voice. So let's talk a little bit about why that works. And the reason it mainly works is um, essentially your nervous system and particularly your central nervous system, your brain, specifically your prefrontal cortex area. So what does that mean, right? All right, so a long time ago, I did a video on sensation and perception. I, I can link it down below, but I'm honestly, like, it maybe it's more confounding than it should be. <laughs> Go figure. I tend to get kind of wordy. Um, but uh, the main thing is, let's talk about that. So let's use just the very simple concept of the nervous system being a computer. Now, like phil philosophers and people who get really into like psychology and a lot of other things, they don't always like that analogy, but just hang with me a sec because it does work if you're trying to conceptualize a few big picture sort of basic things about how it functions, right? And that's what we're all about here. So distilling these really complicated things into something that's a little easier to digest and to apply to your learning as a singer and apply to your own practice of singing, right? So, um, so starting with the sensory system, uh, you have a peripheral sensory system. You also have a viscerosensory system that tends to tell you about your internal state. Like, how's your stomach feeling? Are you hungry? Um, <laughs> sort of your basic physical, you know, do you need to take a bigger breath or you, you know, whatever. That's your viscerosensory system. And then you also have this peripheral sensory system overall that gives you a lot of information about the environment and what's happening, how, you're, how you are interacting with your environment. So are you touching something cold? Is it hot? Is it rough? Is it smooth? Is it heavy? Is it light? You know, um, uh, are you seeing something? Does it look like food? Is it not food? <laughs> essentially, right? Like what colors are there if you're not colorblind? Um, or if you do just in generally have healthy vision, um, general healthy vision, like counting people who wear glasses like myself. Um, you know, and so that's all taking in information. So your sight, you know, sounds, smells, taste, and then also pretty much everything happening with touch, which is actually a lot. Um, and then you also have your kinesthetic, uh, kinesthetic sense of like where you are in space, where my hand is. I know it's here. Even if I don't look at it, I know I'm moving my right hand right now. If I close my eyes, okay, I can move my left hand. I don't have to see it to know I'm doing it, right? So that's because I have sensory receptors sending information in my brain that says, hey, your left hand is moving and, you know, muscle fibers are firing, muscles are stretching, you know, we feel air, you know, air molecules are interacting with the skin, like, you know, there's temperature changes perhaps there, like all kinds of stuff, right? Um, and actually, you'd be kind of surprised. On one of my exams, I remember... Um, in one of the PhD neuroscience classes I took, uh, one of the questions was like essentially list all the sensory information that your brain is receiving, like all the true sensory information that's coming from like holding an object. So temperature, touch, you know, how, like grip strength, all that kind of stuff, um, where your fingers are in space, in terms of how you're gripping it, like all of that had to be in that answer, um, you know, so it's kind of interesting because there's a lot, right? And you're not 
consciously aware of all of that sensory information all the time. Because if you were, you'd be a little overwhelmed. There's like so much happening all the time all around you, right? It's really, you're really bombarded with a lot of sensory information literally all the time from the external world. And then you combine that with the fact that you're getting bombarded from what's happening inside your own body. Like, do you need to go to the bathroom? Do you need to eat? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, that it's like tons of stuff, right? Your brain is getting tons of information. Um, every single millisecond, it's getting tons. Okay. And, um, you know, so it's important, obviously, sensory functional sensory system is super important. Um, super, like more important than you tend to think. Um, even as a clinician, I feel like sensory was sort of like, a, oh yeah, of course there's sensory, but we really focused on motor output because that's what you see, you know, how somebody acts, how somebody behaves, how somebody coordinates muscles together. That's what you see. That's your output. And as a clinician, what you're seeing is a big part and what you're hearing is a big part of how you're making clinical decisions. You know, you're taking what you're seeing, you're kind of mapping it to knowledge you have, and you're saying, hmm, this fits this profile, this doesn't fit that profile, right? Of disease or of injury or whatever it is you're assessing. Um, so, you know, and I think in a similar way, I mean, voice teachers kind of do it in a more informal way where they're, they're being bombarded with certain, they can see what, the, what their student is doing. You know, they like to look at their students, see if there's vocal ease there, and then they're also listening to vocal quality, they're listening to subtle changes, maybe breath, they're listening to a lot of things all at once, and they're taking in all that information, and they're figuring out what they could instruct that student to change the output that they're, you know, they're getting sensory-wise. <laughs> um, so sensory input, super mega important. When it actually reaches the part of your brain where you're aware of what you're doing, okay? So, for example, if I want to hold, like, a cell phone, okay? Um, like I said, ton of sensory information is getting to my brain about holding this. The temperature's slightly cool. It's a smooth surface. Um, due to the shape, I have to grip it a certain way. Um, I could change my grip if I want to. I don't need to use a ton of you know, muscle to do it. Like I, I know like exactly like the weight of it. I'm getting some sort of information about that, but I'm consciously aware of these things because I'm paying attention to it. I can pay attention to the temperature change and to, you know, the weight of the phone, the size of the phone, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, but there's still a lot of information specific to this that I'm not that aware of. Um, so, that's actually, my brain is still getting that. That's how I'm able to hold it. Um, but it's not, um, I'm not, I don't have to be aware of all of it, really, you know? I, I, I can be aware of some things if I pay attention to it. But generally, like, if I just want to check messages, I'm just going to pick up my phone and check messages. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be consciously aware of, like, the temperature of my phone and the weight of the phone and na 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 right? Because I don't need to be at that point in time. I don't need to be aware of that for my brain to still put together the right output for how to hold it, right? So your brain needs input. Sensory information is input. Uh, in terms of computers, without an input, computer has zero output, right? If you don't um, tell your computer to open the browser or to go to YouTube, it's not gonna do anything. If you open a Word doc to type a paper and you don't type a letter, it's just gonna sit there and wait right? You got to have input in order to have something happen. Um, so it's super important. Now what you perceive, even when you get into the level of central nervous system, when you get to like brainstem level and up into cortical areas and you know, your brain, um, you're talking about perception anyway, because the actual sensory information that came from the peripheral, like once again, holding a phone, the actual information that came from the peripheral, peripheral nervous system has been kind of altered essentially as it goes up through different neurons it can get you know kind of so whatever my brain gets from this from my holding it from the actual nerves in my hand that are firing is kind of a summation of like a lot of different signals so it's already getting kind of you know um specified essentially as it gets into my brain 
And that leads to perception. So that leads to the fact that we're kind of getting just sort of a general summation of what's actually happening pretty much all the time. So what we perceive is just kind of a general summation of what's happening in our body at the time or what our muscles are doing, right? So that's why um, actually they've done studies where singers say, oh, I never use my abs for this during breathing or I never do that with my rib cage because that's not what they're really aware of. And actually what, and actually measure what they're actually doing physiologically. And sometimes it's like the dead opposite of what they thought they were doing just because they're perceiving what their body's doing, not because they were doing anything wrong, you know, like they were high level singers, professional singers, they knew what they were doing professionally. Um, but you know, it's like, you think your abs are doing one thing, they're actually doing another. You think your ribcage is doing one thing, maybe it's doing something else. Like, eh, you know, so, all right. So this is getting into why imagery works. So we have sensory inputs in, during the act of singing, you're getting sensory updates continuously about what what's your ribcage doing? What does your larynx feel like? What's it doing? You know, like it, it's all of these subsystems, respiratory, laryngeal, and vocal tract are all gonna send information, and facial, all that. It's gonna send information up to the brain constantly, right? It's just gonna constantly send updates, right? It's like, um, I don't know, you think of like a corporate structure, I guess. It's like it's like the actual like compute the the actual customer service people are actually going to constantly be you know checking in essentially, letting people know. Not that corporates really corporations really work that way. They don't often <laughs> check in, but I guess it's like all those surveys. I guess they're constantly checking in. Um, so sensory information constantly going, cheat, 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 right, going on up there. And that tells your brain a little bit of what you're doing. And then also, of course, you have that internal, like, I need to sing this phrase or I need to hit that note, right? So you've already been given that stimuli that says, we need to accomplish this. And the brain says, okay, I think if I put this together, I'll accomplish that. And then it's gonna constantly get updates as it's accomplishing. It's gonna listen to your sound, your notes, are you on pitch, all that stuff, plus what's your ribcage doing, what's your larynx doing, what is your vocal tract doing, right? Constantly getting those updates. Okay, now that's a lot of information, right? And then you're gonna make some sort of adjustments possibly if, it's, if the output isn't optimal, thanks to those updates, you can make some changes on your next inhale, or maybe on the next vocalization, next exercise you're doing with your, your teacher, maybe after they stop to instruct you a little bit, you can come back in and you can get a different output, um, right? Because, okay, you know, you, you thought you were accomplishing one thing the other way, but turns out it needs to be optimized or maybe it didn't feel as easy here as it needs to, so yeah, I need to try that again, right? Or maybe ah, I didn't really hit that note the way I wanted to or oh, I almost ran out of breath. Let me try it again, right? We do that all the time. <laughs> it's like, uh, sensory-wise, I found out I wasn't doing something I wanted to do. Perceptually, I figured out it wasn't something I wanted to do. So let me adjust that a little bit. Let me adjust my output a little, right? Okay. So remember that. Sensory perception, okay, inputs. Both of those are inputs, right? So when your brain's figuring out output, when it comes to motor processing, motor planning, we could say, that happens at your primary motor strip in your brain, typically left hemisphere, but you know. Um, and it's in your frontal lobe. It's like right near, kind of here-ish in your frontal lobe. Your primary motor strip is like running right through there, okay? Essentially, the, the, the neurons that, tell your body what to do. So when my brain says, pick up a phone, I don't have to figure out exactly where to put my fingers, exactly how much pressure to put, exactly what to do there. I don't have to think about any of that because all my prefrontal cortex, all this like aware part of my brain has to say is, hey, you should pick up your phone, check out your messages. And the motor strip, the motor planning system says, okay, we know how to do that. And it sends the signals that you need to send to actually get it done, right? So when I pick it up, you know, I even like, I picked it up like this. I adjusted my grip, all that stuff that I just did, that I just noticed I did. <laughs> I didn't have to like consciously instruct my body to do it. It just kind of happened, right? 
it seems like it just happened. My perception is like, oh, magically, boom, I picked up a phone. Um, because my motor planning system and my motor output was what we needed it to be. Don't mind the motorcycles going by. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So that's why input's important and then, you know, output's really important, of course. But when your output is really optimized, right, when you're motor planning, if we go really specific to motor planning, because as a singer, that's pretty much what you're doing, right? You're trying to learn how to coordinate your respiratory laryngeal and your vocal tract systems, your power source and filter systems to optimize your sound and sing the aria or sing the number, maybe with choreography, whatever, do it in whatever context you need to do it in and get a paycheck. <laughs> for being able to sing it, right? <laughs> so you get trained for that, right? So there's a motor output we're refining, essentially. We wanna refine the technique, we wanna refine what we're able to do, what we're able to sound like. We wanna sound professional, right? Um, and we wanna do it with vocal ease so that we have the stamina and longevity to keep on doing it and maybe keep on getting paychecks for it, ideally, right? Okay, so, um, so here's where the imagery comes in. And here's the big takeaway, essentially. This is the brrr, drum roll. Get ready for it, folks. Here we go. Um, so your prefrontal cortex, I like to use, I've had lots of customer service jobs in my life, right? Former musician. <laughs> we tend to do that. So um, if you ever work a corporate job, Okay, like you think of a corporate corporate structure, right? You got your little entry level, like I was. You got your managers and your their managers and those managers that go on up through the chain. And then you got like those few people at the top who make the big decisions of where the company's going to go and what they want to do. Okay, right? So I like to think of the prefrontal cortex area, the area where you're really doing a lot of the organizing and how am I going to accomplish this and what do I want to accomplish all that conscious thought you do of like I want to sound like this I want the note to be like this all that stuff happens around there right but that area of your brain is really bad at doing the really detailed planning of how to accomplish that task how to put you know how to coordinate all those muscles, how to coordinate respiratory laryngeal vocal tract together to create the thing you want to create. It's really bad at it, okay? So if you've ever had a corporate job or an entry-level job anywhere where you've had something called micromanaging, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You have that manager who's kind of always on you and like trying to tell you how to do these tiny little tasks that you totally know how to do. It's like, get off my back. I just... If you leave me alone, I'll just get it all done and like pfft, less stress for everybody, right? So if you're using your prefrontal cortex in that sort of micromanaging way of like, okay, so before I start to sing, I need to do this with my stomach and this with my rib cage and I need my throat to be like this and then I need my lips in this position and I need that and I need this and I need this and then I, and then I can go, right? How many times have we done that? where we give ourselves like too many things to think about. I need like 10 things to be in line before I can let voice out of my body, right? So when you're thinking that way, you're being a micromanager. Your primary motor strip is like, we can't send out an ideal signal because you're trying, you're telling us to like, no, <laughs> you know, right? It's like, we don't know what signal this is. What are you trying to go for? We don't know what's, whatever, you know? And it tends to make us really tense when we think of like five billion things at once. We get really, really tense, right? So the idea of using some sort of imagery or maybe just trying to be sort of an outside observer, how is your body feeling? Check in with your throat, how does it feel? All that kind of stuff, you know? It works because it's giving your prefrontal cortex something to think about without being a micromanager. It's giving that part of your brain, that imaginary, that whole organizational, the, the upper man, the, the like the CEO <laughs> of your brain is your prefrontal cortex, okay? It's giving that CEO something to do that's very big picture, very broad, which is what it's really good at. 
so that all those other systems, primary motor strip, maybe amygdala motor pathway, like the emotional motor pathway, because that is a thing that likely exists in humans. Um, I'll talk about that later, I guess. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's giving those, it's like, once you get the big picture up here, then those systems can just do what they need to do. You know what I mean? Your brain is like, okay, I need to think of my breath being like, you know, the, you know, the gas in the cars, I just keep going down the road. It needs to be steady. I need just, you know, a nice, easy, let's say the current in a river. I, I used that one before uh, with students. Um, you know, it's like you get this kind of imagery in your head and you think, okay, if I think about breath, I want to think about it like this. And then your motor strip can go, okay, yeah, we, we, we know how to do that. Sure. Yeah. We, we know what to, yeah, we can, we can tell our, our little, you know, muscles to, to do something that'll give you some sort of output like that. Sure. Yeah. We can accomplish that. Um, so that's what the imagery is for, really. I think the debate, going back to the debate of like, is imagery, is using imagery science? Yes, it's science. Is using imagery a moving target? Uh, so freaking lootly, you know? Imagery that works on one person might not work on the other, right? Especially as a voice teacher. Whatever works for you might not work for your students. You might, <laughs> you know? So the way to use imagery in more of a scientific way is to realize that you're providing some kind of imagery because you're trying to give their conscious brain a constructive thing to think about. Constructive, as in it'll help the motor output rather than like just tie it up in knots and make it really tense. So you're giving it like one, maybe two things to think about and to focus on to change the motor output. Um, so you're giving them the, that imagery and whatever imagery works is what you let that student do. You let that student roll with whatever works. If you're a singer, whatever works for you, that's what you use. When a vocal coach or a new teacher tells you to do something else, but this other thing has really been working for you, just do the other thing. Just smile and nod and go, okay, I'll try that. And then like, give it a try. And if it doesn't work, go back to what you used before and be like, okay, that works better. I'll just keep using that. You don't even have to say it out loud, right? Like, honestly, voice teachers don't actually have to know how you're conceptualizing your singing. I know that sounds so bad. Voice teachers are gonna hate me, but it's true, right? Vocal therapists, really good voice therapists, know that really it's about how you think your voice is functioning. It's about what you think about your breath that gives you vocal ease, that allows you to get through that phrase easily. It's about you balancing the coordination of these subsystems, respiratory, laryngeal, vocal tract. It's about you balancing the coordination of those subsystems. It's about what your body does to balance it. And whatever you think about to get that balance, I don't care. As long as the output is balanced and easy. I'm like, sweet. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, so there can be voice teachers out there, you know, like I remember in my undergrad, there was a voice teacher who was very big on like, like you're holding a marshmallow in your mouth or whatever for like pal palatal stuff or for open throat feeling essentially is what they're going for usually with that. And you know what, honestly, if I think of putting something in my mouth, my tongue goes back. I get really tight. I've had people try to coach me like that before, where it's like, oh, I can have something in your mouth. And then my tongue moves back and I get really tight because in my mind, pretending I have something large like a marshmallow in the back of my tongue makes me think, uh-oh, I might choke on this marshmallow and my body starts to like, <laughs> it's like it's like going into almost like a swallowing position not ideal for singing, right? What helps me attain more of an open throat is really large, relaxed inhale and really think of tall. That's something that really helped me. I tried to think back for a while, tongue would get bunched, etc. If I think tall, if I think pharyngeal space is very like tall that way, it helps me more. It helps me more than fat throat. It helps me more than marshmallow on the back of the tongue. It helps me more than a big C shape that's getting bigger and pulled back. Because anytime I think back or fat or anything like that, I tend to get tongue tension. And that's just me. That's how I react to those things. Other singers can use those concepts all the time 
Like, there might, there's probably a singer out there, obviously, clearly, this teacher at work, because she got really great results. So her students could think about marshmallows all the time and be totally fine with it, you know? And, <laughs> or maybe they just translated it to something else in their head and they were totally fine with that. But that's really the name of the game. Uh, game. So whenever you attain a technique that's working, that's professional level, that gives you that stamina, gives you the vocal flexibility to do what you need to do in whatever style you're singing in, right? Allows you to get through your shows, get through your schedule, you know, without feeling a lot of strain or anything at the end, you feel fine, you don't need a lot of vocal rest, like whatever, okay? Um, once you attain that kind of level of technique, then whatever concepts you use to get yourself to that level, just keep using them. And if they stop working, maybe get either try new, new concepts on your own, play around with it a little, or go back to a teacher, go back to a, a reliable coach or something and see if you can just explore with some other new concepts. Because maybe, you know, as you as you age, things change, and maybe your body just needs something else to have a better output, right? So that's the main thing, is that your body's getting sensory information all the time. You're perceiving only a fraction of what you're actually doing and um, what's actually happening at any moment in time. And your prefrontal cortex is a really bad micromanager of the motor system when it comes to muscle output, how muscles are coordinating together to create a certain sound, or certain coordination, it's horrendous at it. So if you're giving yourself too many things to think about, then you're micromanaging your motor system. And the big takeaway here is don't micromanage the motor system. Just consciously think something, imagery, one concept, one big picture concept that helps you just to like go, you know? To breathe and go. Instead of breathe, line up everything, think. That usually is like 100% recipe for tension right there. And listen, I am preaching to myself here too because I was the quintessential like lot of tension for a long time with my muscle tension dysphonia secondary to my paresis. I had lots of tension here. I wasn't aware of it. I was habituated to it. But oh my gosh, like how many times did I like, you know, inhale, <gasps> okay, I need my soft palate, I need my tongue, I need, huh, let me check in with everything and sing. And by the time I've held my breath that long, by the time I make all those adjustments, I'm already like super tight, super tense, and did not take a big enough breath, et cetera, et cetera. I just set myself up for failure essentially by thinking I could just like do it between the exhale and the inhale. It's like that's not enough time to think like 10 or five or 10 things. I should have just stuck to like one concept at a time, you know? So I like to think of respiratory and laryngeal system perceptually staying fairly stable. My exhale needs to be fairly stable, consistent, and pretty minimal actually. So I need a lot of strength there to really control my exhale. And then, um, you know, and then my laryngeal system stays, as long as it's easy, it feels like it's not even there, not even that aware of it as being a thing that exists, which is perfect. And then I can think of, you know, any sort of vocal quality change or anything like that can just be, it's a lot of those little movements in here, or maybe just big concepts just to get an overall different shape in my vocal track, you know? But I still want to check in with those other, with my larynx and my respiratory system and think, oh, hey, as long as, you know, whatever concept I think of to change the color of my vocal track, I still need this to feel very easy nearly non-existent, essentially easy, and my respiratory system needs to feel stable and steady and controlled, right? This is where all the control is in my head. Because if I think of control here, I'm toast. I'm gonna have so much tension, it's gonna be awful. I can't do it. I can't think of controlling here. I honestly can't think of controlling here either, honestly. The only place where the word control can come into my brain while I'm singing is on big inhale and now control the exhale. Make it a nice easy exhale. Really use the inspiratory muscles to, to break the exhalation, to hold back the exhalation, to keep the ribcage really big. It's the appoggio. Okay, I have to think that way. That's the only time I can think of control. It's, but it's like isometric. It feels like hardly anything's happening there. It feels super steady when I really have nice control over it. 
And that's when I can tell I'm super out of shape. Like right now, I haven't practiced breath like that in a long time. So if I tried to sing through like a Mozart aria right now, oh, my breath would be awful. <laughs> I'd have to breathe like so much more than I ever should have to breathe because I just, my, 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 the inspiratory muscles that need to hold back that airflow are in, are way out of shape. <laughs> They're just way out of shape. So, um, yeah, so that's the big thing. Imagery is scientific, as long as you're using it as a way to improve the motor output of your students, and as long as your students understand that you gave them the imagery to think about in order to see what would happen. You know, it's like, okay, I needed a way for you to make your exhale more steady, so I had you think about that, and it did make it more steady. So great, you know? We wanted a way to get a different vocal quality from you, so I had you think about this kind of vocal coloring or this kind of emotion or this kind of, you know, scenery or whatever it is. And we got there. We got a different vocal color with this still maintaining nice coordination, nice easy voicing. That's all it is. So hopefully that ends some of the debate. Sorry, I have like a little cow licky thing going on. <laughs> um, <laughs> with the hair, it's like, bing. Um, so you know, that's it for, for imagery. Imagery can be scientific. You just have to make sure you're using it in a smart way. And as you're learning to be a better voice teacher, if you're kind of an early stage voice teacher, just the more you can think of imagery, the better. And honestly, biggest tip I have for you for early voice teachers is check in with the student. How do you feel when you did that? Even when it wasn't great, when you know it was kind of tense and you want to fix it, it'll be like, what did it feel like your breath was doing? And nine times out of 10, the student will say, I don't know. And you go, okay, let's do it again. I want you to think about how does it feel? How does your ribcage feel? How does your stomach feel? What does it feel like from here down, right? And then if they say, well, it feels like I was holding my breath. Then you go, oh, okay. Well, how can we not hold the breath then? You know, what feels like you're not holding the breath? When you're just, let's do without singing, let's, <sighs> what does that feel like? It feels fluid. It feels like it's moving. It feels like it's, you know, yeah, okay, great, fluid. Let's think of that then. Let's think of like water moving, a waterfall, maybe, you know, the lazy river at a water park, whatever, you know, map it to fluid then. Think about your breath more like the lazy river at the water park. And the student goes, okay, they give you that look like, what? Okay, sure, crazy person. And then they try the phrase again and suddenly it's better. And it's like, how did that feel? Oh, it felt a lot easier. Exactly, because you didn't hold your breath, because you thought fluid. And you were thinking of that lazy river water park type of breath and your body figured out what to do. Yay, right? So that's an example of how you wanna use that imagery to kind of help your student along. And, you know, easy way to come up with something that might work for them is have them describe what it feels like when it's not working and then think of the opposite. Just be a thesaurus, be, be a thesaurus and think of literally the antonym. <laughs> you know, held, hmm, opposite of holding is like releasing or maybe going, maybe, you know, think of, you know, synonyms to the opposite and be like, what clicks in their brain? Like what kind of imagery could they pull out from that? And a lot of times I found my students refining that imagery as they go along. Like maybe the lazy river worked a while, like just in that lesson, but then next week they're like, you know, I found that like thinking of a waterfall really started helping me even more. And then I'm like, great, think about a waterfall. You know, <laughs> I don't care. You sound amazing. We just wanna keep going on that track of you sound amazing. That's what we want, okay, right? So that's a little tip of how to use imagery um, scientifically in that sense to kind of help adjust how someone's coordinating their muscles. All right, I hope that's helpful to someone out there. Sorry for the long video yet again. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll try to remember where I was when I said certain things so that you guys can try to tag that below so that you can just sort of fast forward to what you need. All right, folks. Um, I will see you guys next time. I actually had a request from someone to do a bit on the power source filter model of conceptualizing respiratory laryngeal and vocal tract. And um, I have mentioned it 
off and on throughout other videos, but I think it is a really good idea to focus on how you can use that concept, like actively, as you're trying to figure out something in your singing, or maybe as a teacher trying to figure out something with your students singing. So I will address that model, and I will um, use it as a way for you to kind of conceptualize in a big picture way what you might want to target with your students or with yourself.